So there's this story that I've heard about over the years, and of course I've heard about it as a Halloween true crime story. And it's pretty much been reduced to that, bookmarked as the Halloween true crime story, and it's it's only the surface of this story. And I found certain things that the casual tellings of this story never even touched upon or aren't even aware of. This would become an international incident. But what a lot of people don't realize about this story is that that 44 caliber bullet that took Yoshihiro Hattori's life, it did more damage than anyone could have imagined for the next 30 years. So I'm about to take you back to 1992 and introduce you to two boys that probably couldn't be any more different. They could not be any less likely to have become friends because this is the pre-internet age to meet each other in the first place because they live on opposite sides of the globe from each other one in america one in japan so basically yeah good luck on ever meeting something in the universe would bring these two boys together and the word that pops into my head is serendipitous and i looked it up okay just to make sure i was using serendipitous correctly and i read that it means discovered by chance in a happy or beneficial way and as this is a true crime case you know happy most of the time isn't the case and beneficial in a case that is so painful it's hard to find something that is beneficial in this story but i can promise you that we can actually find both instances uh, in this case the haymaker family is this wonderful highly respected family in baton rouge louisiana now richard haymaker is a college professor a theoretical physicist which I had to look up. It says here that it's a scientist who uses mathematical models and theories to explain, predict, and understand natural phenomena. Still no clue. And here is his lovely wife, Holly, who is a family physician and a female reproductive rights activist. So yes, both these human beings are very impressive. And so it would only be fitting that they were raising a very impressive young man, their pride and joy, 16 year old Webb Haymaker. Now Webb is a reserved boy. He is soft-spoken and respectful, an introvert in many ways, just like his old man is. Now, as the universe would have it, 7,000 miles across the Pacific in Nagoya Aichi Prefecture of Japan, there was this other highly respected family with their own 16-year-old boy, surnamed the Hattori's. Now, the father is Masa Ichi Hattori. He's a respected engineer, and his wife is Mieko a devoted homemaker raising their three children. One is Sachiko, one is Akira, and then they have their middle child, which is the topic of today's story, 16-year-old Yoshi Hiro. Now, we're just gonna call him Yoshi, and this boy, he loved meeting new people. He longed for adventures. It was an interesting time for the Hattori family because Yoshihiro, on a whim, he applied for something called the Morita Foundation Scholarship, which was in conjunction with the American Field Service, or just known as the AFS, and they were offering a one-year exchange program to America. Yoshihiro applied, you know, with no expectations. He submitted this simple entry paper on why he should be chosen. So he writes, Wherever I go, I wish I could make the country a second home country. I can make Japanese cuisines like tempura cutlet for my host family and introduce them to the way of Japanese living. And to Yoshi's delight, he was accepted. Everyone was extremely excited for Yoshi, although he is just 16 years old, he's still mommy's baby and his parents they were nervous, of course, to have him leave home for a whole year, but it was a great once-in-a-lifetime experience for their boy, and he would surely come home as a man. Now, Yoshi learned that his destination would be that of Baton Rouge, Louisiana. He would brush up on his English, but mind you, 
His English was not much to begin with, so by August, he was giving his parents and his siblings this tearful goodbye, you know, as he was embarking on this adventure to America. So in this exchange program, Yoshi is considered a homestay student. That just simply means that it's already been arranged for him to stay with a host family. Now, I'm pretty sure you guys don't have to guess very hard who that host family is. Now, the Haymakers, they've been through this before. This isn't their first rodeo with a foreign exchange student. I believe they've done it three times before. So they accepted Yoshihiro with open arms and made him feel right at home. Now, even though Yoshi's English was very limited, the Haymakers' southern hospitality cut right through the barriers. And yeah, Yoshi did feel at home. And... Webb, being the sweetheart that he is, made Yoshi feel extremely comfortable. He treated Yoshi just like his own brother. Webb's mother, Holly, she just found his free spirit to be just this wonderful hallmark of the boy's personality. And he was just a joy for everyone to be around. So now you get the atmosphere of this household. Things are moving, things are working. Nothing's awkward. Now Webb, of course, being that they are the exact same age, would be Yoshi's guide to McKinley High School, which they would be attending. Now, Webb himself was a brilliant student. He was enrolled in the East Baton Rouge's program for gifted students. He was very similar to his father, Richard, in terms of academics and being an introvert socially. But now, Webb was paired up with Yoshi, who was the extreme extrovert. It didn't take long for anyone to see that this kid was a magnet for others. He surely didn't need help when it came to making friends. Yoshi's appetite for life in general was infectious and something that Webb admired. Now. You gotta keep in mind, this is a foreign exchange student and barely spoke the language. Most kids in that situation, we'd be overwhelmed, scared, at least, at least shy. But it appeared that to Yoshi, this was not an issue. Yoshi had even signed up for a jazz dance class. Now I am embarrassed to even dance in front of the mirror alone. So anybody that could do what Yoshi is doing here, I, I, they have my admiration, that is for sure. And as I'm researching this story, right, I'm, I'm reaching out to key characters in the story at the same time, you know, just to get a better understanding, you know, to have a little bit more clarity to certain situations. But as the weeks go by, you know, there's no response. So I'm thinking, you know what, everybody's moved on with their lives. That's great. I'll just deal with the facts that I can gather, right, and tell this story as best I could. And then I get an email and I'm really excited. So mind you, um, she was only 14 at the time of this murder in 1992, but she did go to the same high school as the boys did. And she even attended the same class as Yoshi and knew him and communicated with him personally. So I was really excited to get a better idea of who Yoshi was and at one point in our conversation I was sharing with her some of the information I gathered about this case and there was one part of it that completely caught her off guard and I, I actually thought she already knew but she didn't and let's just say the interview got pretty emotional for her and if you guys don't see that part of the interview is only because I cut it out in respects to her because she will get to see this video first and if she doesn't feel she wants to show that maybe vulnerable side of things you know I'm gonna cut it out but if you do then that means she found that maybe that moment is important to the telling of this story you know, I'm glad for anything that you do to bring this story to light and, and make sure that it isn't forgotten. Yes. And um, I really appreciate you sharing some of your time. I know you penciled me in for 30 minutes and I'm going to squeeze every second out of that 30 <laughs> okay. minutes, I hope, <laughs> okay, to get great. as much. OK, so in this part of the video, I just wanted to touch on the social economical parts of Baton Rouge in 1992. And hey, who better? to get a contact of than somebody that was there in 1992 and better mm -hmm. yet, someone that actually went to McKinley High and <laughs> with Webb and with Yoshi and knew Yoshi personally, right? Mm -hmm. You've had contacts. Did you ever have conversations with Yoshi? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. You know, they were broken. 
they were broken conversations because he couldn't speak good English. He was trying to learn English. But yeah, I mean, he was in my PE class. Um, I was 14 years old. He was 16. And, you know, it was October um, when he was killed. So really, I only had about two months in class with him on a daily basis. Mm. But um, yeah, I mean, we talked. We definitely talked. And he was, yeah, I mean, he was just a really fun, jovial person. And as I said in my story, you know, one of the, I mean, you know, I was a 14 year old. I was, I was starting high school at McKinley High. I was a freshman. And um, we had a Japanese exchange student in our, fr our freshman PE class. And it was kind of novel. You know, I didn't have, we, we didn't get to meet Japanese people ever. And uh, I mean, from Japan, you know, and uh, who spoke Japanese. So he was kind of like this, um, you know, fun novelty in the class. So <laughs> he and he was a very um, I mean, he was a very jovial guy. You know, the, the pictures online of him are serious, right? He's not smiling. He almost looks like a little intimidating, but he was a sweet, um, friendly, warm, I'd say extroverted person and very engaged. And even though he couldn't speak English very well, I mean, he was learning, you know, he's had little, little words here and there. And, um, I mean, he was completely engaged and fully engaged. So in my, in my blog, I wrote that one of the coolest things was that he liked to kind of show off his, his physical abilities. So he would, and we were in gym class, right? So really, I felt like for the first month or two, we didn't do anything in gym class. We just sat on the bleachers and, you know, the teacher did whatever notes and we just all sat around talking and, and, and stuff. But, um, he would do push ups on the gym, on the wood gym floor, and he would have people sit on his back like a one person, not lots of people, but one person sat on his back and he would show off how many he would, he would, you know, show off and, um, you know, test himself. Like how many more pushups could he do with this person on his back? So of course we were all blown away. Like, whoa, how are you doing that? Yeah. Um, I'm blown away. I have a five-year-old who does that and I can't get up <laughs> <laughs> So to have a full grown, I guess, 14 year old on your back. Yeah. He's pretty strong. <laughs> So yeah. I, I read that he did rugby back in Japan, which I didn't know that was a thing in Japan, but he must yeah. have been yeah, a pretty physically strong kid. Yoshi wanted to experience as much as he could in this life, and that was obvious to everyone, especially the haymakers. They wound up getting him a bicycle with lights and a helmet so that he could go ahead and go explore his new surroundings, right? And especially get himself to those jazz dance classes that he loved so much. Holly even made him a map of the school so that if he ever got lost in between classes, he could refer to it. You know, it was just gestures like that that allows us to know what kind of household it was at the time with Yoshi there. It was, it felt comfortable, you know, it seemed loving and supportive. Now, remember, Yoshi landed on the 1st of August and by mid-August, him and Webb, they were already very close. They were just like brothers. And it was around this time that the two boys decided to host a pool party for their high school buddies at the Haymakers Backyard Pool. So on the day, everyone was having fun, you know, in the pool until Webb made a critical mistake that ended the party prematurely. So the boys decided to play a game called Marco Polo. Now here is where Webb made his critical mistake. So he was outside of the pool and he dives back into the pool, forgetting that he was diving into the shallow part. His head hits the bottom of the pool floor and he severely injures his neck. He had to be taken to intensive care where it was revealed that he had broken his neck. And to make things worse, Doctors at the time, they couldn't confidently say if Webb could even walk again. Now, you got to imagine the heartache of the family in the waiting room and getting a news like that about your 16-year-old son. That's crushing. But Webb was in the right place and got top-notch treatment. And he was on a road to a full recovery, right? A big sigh of relief. Yoshi and the Haymakers couldn't ask for anything more but no one could have ever guessed the devastation awaiting them just around the corner. Now that September, Holly took the boys to a blues festival and by nature, Yoshi, 
even with his broken English, was able to socialize and make friends. It's not surprising at this point. But he wound up meeting another Japanese exchange student, a girl, and he took a liking to her, she took a liking to him, and she wound up inviting him and Webb to this upcoming Halloween party that was being set up by her host family, and other exchange students would be there, so Yoshi and Webb should come as well. This was the exact kind of event that Yoshi would be excited about. And Yoshi wasn't the kind to hide any emotions. If he's happy, he's smiling abroad. Now, so naturally, Webb wanted Yoshi to go to this party even though he was still in pain because of his neck injury and he was wearing this noticeably giant neck brace. Now, it wouldn't take long for Yoshi to know what he wanted to be for the party. He was going to be John Travolta from Saturday Night Fever. He had become a huge fan of the movie after seeing it with the Haymakers. Richard, Webb's father, said that Yoshi didn't just walk in the house. He had a way of moving and gliding around, which makes me think it's probably because of the movie, right? So he's a big fan. He probably always had like this funky tune in his head that he had to dance to. And honestly, guys, as you learn about Yoshi, doesn't it make you feel that you, <laughs> you, I, we just aren't excited enough to be alive, right? This kid is amazing. I love how he's described because to meet a person like that, that only adds value to your life. You know, happiness, right? It de-ages you if you laugh a lot and enjoy things to that degree. You know, you remember more things that you enjoy. I liken Yoshi to my own mother. I describe her a lot of the times as being happy for no reason. And I think Yoshi had that same spirit. Oh, what the fuck? Okay, so before the party, Webb took Yoshi to a tuxedo store where he rented himself a white ruffled shirt and a light blue blazer tuxedo. For Webb, he wanted something to, I guess, play off the neck brace that he's gonna have to wear anyway. So he cleverly just placed another bandage over his head and he went as what he simply was, an injured high school boy. So the night of the party, it would land on a Saturday. And since the boys were away, Richard and Holly decided to go on a date. They would watch the new hit movie called The Last of the Mohicans. Now, Webb and Yoshi were on their way to central Louisiana, which was a good 20 minute drive. And this would be a good spot to go over the social economic climate of Louisiana in the 90s. So what kind of environment would you say Yoshi was entering when he came uh, to Baton Rouge in 1992? I feel like I want I hope you'll do a little research on this because mm -hmm. you know I I left Louisiana and Baton Rouge when I was about 17 or 18 and I went to school in Georgia. Okay. And I really being a kid during that time I, really a lot of my information I have about the climate of Baton Rouge really came through my parents. Right. So you know I haven't actually done research like what were the crime rates but I did I put it in my blog, right? Because my parents viewed Baton Rouge as dangerous. They viewed New Orleans as dangerous, you know, um, and that came through, right? So right. like when I started driving, I was not allowed to drive to certain areas of the city. There were big parts of the city that were forbidden for me to drive when I was 15 and 16 years old, once, okay. once I did start driving. So, you know, New Orleans, like even today, I will not be comfortable going to New Orleans and being there at night. Um, I mean, I will be on high alert for crime. Um, one of the other things that was case characteristic and still is of Louisiana is that we have, um, you know, we have some big disparities, social, socioeconomic disparities, right? So you can have, um, you know, you can have like a very rich uh, neighborhood and I'm, and pardon me for saying rich white neighborhood, uh, and then you can have a very poor neighborhood right next to it that has a lot of crime and had people of color. So you right. could have these really like and a, a lot of cities do have this right. or did it did. But that's that was the makeup of Baton Rouge. So McKinley was in a um, it was in the kind of the the city. Let's see. What do I want to say? I mean, I lived out in the suburbs. I was, a you know. 
I was my, I came from a middle class family that was out in the burbs, and I was being bussed into McKinley High. It took forty five minutes or something like that to get there. Um, but this, but the school was just not far away from the LSU campus. And it really, in my view, it was, it was definitely in an area that my parents considered unsafe. <laughs> the inner um, city. Yeah, say. inner mm-hmm. city, right? Mm-hmm. And um, I mean, not the true downtown, because then there was the Baton, you know, Cap- Baton Rouge is the capital of Louisiana. Then there's like kind of the true downtown where the capital is and the, the capital building. But um, yes, it was inner city. Um, definitely disadvantaged, um, communities around McKinley. Um, and it was just like, you could practically walk. It was a, you know, maybe a mile to the LSU campus. Um, so yeah, it was, um, I mean, you know, McKinley had problems. So for example, in our Spanish classes, kids would pick up big handfuls of gravel and throw it into the windows of our class. Like, Teenagers would run through the hallways and like slam the doors as hard as they can. The teachers did not have control of the school. They did not have control. Uh, There was a lot of misbehavior in the, in the regular students at the school. Um, We had a, we had, we had violence at the school. Occasionally we had some very big, scary uh, professional football player or not professional, but they were football player Mm. um, principal and assistant principal who kind of through in my view, kind of through intimidation helped control the, some of the behavior problems in the school. So this wasn't like, you know, suburbia high school. This was like an inner city high school with some, with some challenges, you know. Going back to the night of the party as Webb and Yoshi traveled to central Louisiana, you can bet that things weren't getting much safer and the citizens weren't getting less paranoid. Webb pulled up to 10311 East Brookside, a house adorned with Halloween decorations, three cars were already in the driveway, seemed like the right place. So Webb parked on the curb, he and Yoshi got out and walked to the house and rang the doorbell. But surprisingly, no one answered. They could hear tappings on the window from within, so they knew somebody was in there. They knew somebody was home. Now, off to the side, of the house was this open carport with cars underneath and it was attached to the house. The door from the carport opened and Bonnie Piers peered out to see Webb standing at her front door and found his appearance rather odd, of course. Remember, this was only mid-October, so no one was expecting trick-or-treaters. But there was this boy in her front door with a neck brace and bandages and she didn't know what to think. Then she realized that the injured boy wasn't alone. Another kid in a suit was there as well, and she didn't like the way he looked or moved at all. She immediately slammed the door shut and retreated back inside. Webb and Yoshi, they heard that door slam and looked in confusion, all right? Webb starts to come to the realization that, hey, They might be at the wrong address. They might be at the wrong house and tells Yoshi that they should head back to the car. As the boys get back to the car, the door opens again. But this time it's Rodney Pierre's and he steps out with a 44 caliber Magnum revolver. And this had a scope attached. It was a hunting gun. The boys turn around. Webb stayed where he was, but Yoshi, thinking that they were being finally let into this party, started heading back towards the house, towards Rodney. Rodney points the gun at Yoshi and yells, freeze! But Yoshi did not stop and joyfully said in his broken English, we're here for the party. Instantaneously, Webb is in the background, yelling for Yoshi to stop. Webb could clearly see that the man was holding a weapon, but it was too late. When Yoshi was five feet away from Rodney, a 44 caliber bullet ripped through his left lung. Yoshi collapses to the ground and Rodney runs back inside the house and locks the door. Webb ran over to Yoshi's side and in Webb's own description, Yoshi was crying and moaning, but still awake. 
Now, knowing how dire this situation is, Webb ran over to the house next door and frantically yelled for help. The neighbor, a man named Stan, he came out. He hollered at his wife to go ahead and call the ambulance and followed Webb back to Yoshi. Now, Stan knew what to do. He started raising Yoshi's legs and he told Webb to put pressure on Yoshi's wounds. This was the scene for the next 30 minutes. I've read as long as 40 minutes as well, but either or. Stan, he, he was yelling for Rodney to come outside and help as well, not knowing that Rodney was the one that shot the boy. Bonnie would respond by shouting back, go away. Now, I can't tell if that's an embellished part of this story, that Bonnie would open the window to yell, go away when somebody was clearly dying in her front yard because of her husband, I, I can't wrap my mind around that. So I'm gonna think that never happened. The ambulance would finally arrive and rush Yoshi away, but Yoshi would take his final breaths on that ambulance before he ever made it to the hospital. Now, Crosstown, the Haymakers, they're leaving the theater now. They, they thoroughly enjoyed the movie, even though they thought it was rather violent, which led Holly to make this statement that she recounts as, it's great that this country isn't as violent as that anymore. She would say this to Richard and the universe, as if to remind the Haymakers that, nonetheless, there is still violence in this world. Holly's pager goes off. Once she finds a phone, an officer on the other end, to cushion the blow immediately, tells her, hey, your son Webb is fine, but that Yoshi, well, he is not, and that she would not be needing to go to any hospital. The boy is dead. But this is the thing. In Louisiana, a lot of people have guns, and a lot of people consider it their, not just their right, but their um, protection. And um, that was something that was a real issue in this case, you know, is that culture. Um, and I think and I, and I don't know if you I didn't study the, um, you know, the court case. Like, I, I've, I mean, I think I'd probably learn a lot more if I read the whole court case and everything that was said and all that. But um, I think the climate was just very tricky. You know, you have an area of the country that is um, has crime. You have people who really believe guns are um, a solution, a way to protect themselves from crime. Mm -hmm. um, and I want you to look into the type of bullet that Rodney Pierce used. 44 I, caliber. Okay. Mm -hmm. I, again, I didn't do the research, but my mom made it very clear to me that the type of bullet he used was a cop killer bullet. Mm -hmm. It's it's large. It's a, it was a large 44 caliber magnum with a scope on it. So it was mainly used for hunting. Large game. Oh. Yeah. But you need to look into the type of bullet. Okay. Because what I believe happened is it opens up inside of the person's body so that it cannot oh. be removed. Future Monks here in the editing room. And this lovely lady here is Dr. Nelson. Now, when Yoshi was killed, she spearheaded the Daffodils Project to plant daffodils behind the Baton Rouge Capitol building in Yoshi's honor, as well as a gun education bill. Needless to say, she took Yoshi's death very seriously. She would even meet with the Haymakers and the Hattori's and was heavily involved in the activism. And I found this quote from Dr. Nelson very interesting, very telling in a sense. She said, The bullet used by Pierre's in the killing was especially lethal, causing excess tissue damage to its victim. Now, I did a little googling, and I think she means that it was a 44 caliber pre-fragmented or frangible bullet which explodes within its target, creating increased damage. And what I think Dr. Nelson is alluding to is that if he was using a pre-fragmented bullet, he must have been definitely shooting to kill. When Richard and Holly arrive at the police station, they race to Webb, who was sitting alone on a bench in this cold, harsh-lit room. There was blood on his shirt and his hands. And he turns and he says, Mom, what happens when somebody gets shot in the chest like that? And I said, well, sometimes they make it, 
and sometimes they don't. And Yoshi didn't. And Webb took his head in his hands like this and went, oh, his poor mother. And started crying. So I found an excerpt from an interview with Richard Haymaker, and he recalled that in the wake of the killing, Webb appeared dispassionate, which concerned him and Holly. Richard remembers leaving that police station saying to his son, Webb, it is not your fault. And it appeared that Webb was internalizing the trauma. And in time, they took him to a psychologist because Webb simply seemed too unaffected by the murder or killing of Yoshi. And by the end of the session, Webb's nervous response, according to Richard, was simply, I'll get over it. You as a 14-year-old at the time, how did you personally handle the news when you heard about Yoshi? I was just shocked. Mm -hmm. I really was just shocked. That's all I can um, describe. You know, I, I didn't really know where to put it. I didn't understand, you know, how it mm -hmm. could happen. And really, as a 14, and I had just turned 14, as a 14 year old, I mean, it really, and it really was just like, okay, but where's my classmate? Like, where's my friend, you know, right. I, where, but then he was gone every day after that, you know, that, that was really almost as far as it went for me, which is, you know, is strange, but that's, I think that's just the limit of your understanding when you're that young. My mother though, I remember her reaction, right? Okay. So I, t I come home from school and I had already told her about Yoshi. Cause of course I had stories about Yoshi with the pushups and the silly things and the Japanese foreign exchange student. And she was blown away. She wouldn't, she didn't believe me. She was like, no way that didn't happen. I was like, mom, they said he was shot and killed and she couldn't believe it. And then when she looked into it, of course it was true and she sprung into action doing all kinds of activism around it and just grieving herself because even though she had never met him, she was just um, brokenhearted that such a terrible thing could happen to a young young boy at our at our high school. So um, I think I almost experienced it through her, honestly, yeah. because she was the one that was enough of an adult to get the gravity of the situation. I was just a little kid, really. Mm -hmm. And you actually internalized the situation similar to how Webb did in, in terms of my research. He was considered dispassionate by his mm -hmm. parents. They said he, he didn't seem as affected as he should have been after his friend was murdered. He actually, I guess, caved into himself, into his mm -hmm. own thoughts. And he said mm -hmm. he didn't really understand his emotions until the second civil trial. Or Pierre's where he actually was convicted that he was able to let it out and take in that his friend was gone. It's yeah. very interesting. And he was in the gifted program as you were. And unfortunately, you did, never got to meet Webb. Right. Right. So he I saw him around school because he had a big cast on his neck. He was, you know, you could and he was red haired. So you can, you know, easily spot him. And I knew I knew of him because well, Yoshi would talk about him, and I knew that was Yoshi's family, uh, yeah. host family. So yeah, um, he was yeah I did, but I but I'm not surprised when I, I read that too about Webb, and I thought yeah, you know we were just too young to yeah. understand what it means to lose a life. I mean, you can't understand what it means to lose a life until you fully appreciate what life is, you know. Now, why Yoshi didn't stop? We have to take into consideration a few things. Okay, so one is that Yoshi's English was very poor and he might not have understood the word or even context of what freeze should indicate in that situation. They dubbed this case in Japan as the freeze case to teach others how one of their own was lost because he did not understand what basically is an American slang for stop. And the more I think of it, who uses the term freeze? Cops, police officers, you know, people of authority or people who want authority or maybe just those that watch a little too much police movies. Now, I'm not proud of it, but I've had to pull out a gun before 
You know, it didn't make me feel macho. I felt awkward. I felt stupid. I used to work at a liquor store in my past life, and the gun was simply shown as a deterrent because a man was acting strange, but it didn't strike me to yell freeze now that I think back. I yelled stop. Hey, stop. Or maybe that's just me. Japanese programs felt it was important to now offer lessons about the English word freeze. They explained to their citizens that if you go to America and Americans point a gun at you and yells freeze, it means don't move or I'll shoot. And do I need to say that is a pretty sad state of affairs? If you have to teach people that the place they might want to go might shoot you if you don't know their lingo. And you could also ask why Yoshi didn't stop when the man was clearly aiming a gun at him. Well, it's possible that Yoshi was expecting people to be in costumes and figured the gun was just a toy. Guns aren't a normal thing to see in Japan. And I'm not saying Yoshi didn't know what a gun looks like, but in that context of Halloween, he probably thought, it was a prop. And there's one unfortunate event that I read, and that was Yoshi had lost one of his contact lenses, so his vision wasn't perfect. It wasn't great, as a matter of fact, at that moment. Now, he could have worn glasses, but, you know, he's 16 years old. He wants his costume to look right, right? So maybe the glasses didn't fit his outfit. Knowing that, Yoshi, at a distance, probably didn't even know Rodney was holding a gun until it was too late. But since we can't know what was in Yoshi's head at that moment, we can say that he did not know he was in some type of imminent danger, okay? Because he did keep moving forward. So when the news finally got to the Hattori family, it took a little time for things to sink in for them. I mean, it had just been two months since they said goodbye to their beautiful, happy boy every day looking forward to him coming home to them, seeing his smiling face again. And uh, Masaichi, you know, Yoshi's father, said that he kept thinking that Yoshi was any day now getting on that plane and coming back to Japan, coming back to him. It took him a long time to come to accept that his boy was never coming home. Mieko, on the other hand, his mother would just simply sit in his bedroom and cry. Eventually, the couple began to prepare their trip for Louisiana. They had a funeral to prepare for to say their last goodbyes. And for the haymakers, they were nervous, okay, about meeting Yoshi's parents, simply because they didn't know how much of the blame would be cast on them. You know, why weren't they looking after Yoshi? You know, he and Webb, they're just 16 years old. Why were they out by themselves at night? And why are Americans so stupid and violent? The haymakers, they simply didn't know what to expect from grieving parents who had just experienced the ultimate loss. And they were terrified about that. So when the meeting finally happened, okay, Mieko's first words to the haymakers were, how is Webb? The question was perfect. Remember, the first thought that Webb had when he learned that Yoshi died was to grieve for Mieko. Now here was Mieko, and her first instinct was to ask about Webb. It conveyed that there was no blame or ill will towards the haymakers. Instead, the roles of concern were reversed for the other child who was there, the one that had to now live with the experience of watching another human die. The tension the haymakers had was absolved. It showed them what kind of people the Hattoris are. And now the haymakers were about to show the Hattoris that most Americans were not in the slightest like those Pierres. So let it be known that the night of the shooting, police did bring Rodney in for questioning down at the station, but it was reported that he was not charged with any crime and even released shortly after because they felt that he had been in his right to shoot the trespasser. The Hattori's and the Haymakers 
Well, they felt very differently. So, in conjunction with each other, the families met with the Louisiana governor and were in contact with the Japanese consulate to pursue Rodney Pierce for criminal charges. The media in both countries were ramping up coverage and the pressure was on. And suddenly, Rodney was formally indicted by a grand jury and charged with manslaughter, which could mean, if convicted, he would be facing up to 40 years in prison. The bond was set at $100,000. Rodney's parents' house was put up against that so that Rodney could, you know, stay at home instead of a cell awaiting the trial. So by now, the news is international. Okay, news teams from Japan, they traveled all the way to Louisiana to cover the trial firsthand. People were being interviewed left and right about their feelings, you know, on the case. One of Rodney's neighbors, okay, it's a man named Frank, said, if folks don't help their neighbors, they're not much. Which, I'll say, is a commendable statement. It really is. Only if your neighbor didn't just gun down an innocent 16-year-old boy in front of their yard, then maybe, Frank, just wait a little bit longer before you say that. Frank, he was an avid supporter of Rodney. He would even rally the community together to start this defense fund for the Pierce family. I have nothing against that. Frank told reporters, we are sympathetic with the Japanese family as well. We're just trying to take care of our own. Now, <laughs> maybe I have a problem with how he said that, okay? Notice how he didn't mention the Hattori's by name, which he definitely knows their name, referred to them as the Japanese family. That's too formal in a case like this. And the use of the term our own. Now, if you were in the police department, right, the boys in blue, right, if you were in the military, you know, brothers in arms or whatnot, protect our own, right? That makes perfect sense. But Frank, you're a civilian now, referencing another white man that killed a colored person. It sounds bad, Frank. It really does sound a little bit racially and even socially tone deaf. I could be wrong. And there were plenty of people that were on Rodney's side and really... Nothing is wrong with that. But they were angry on Rodney's behalf that he was even going to trial. And so petitions were created and they started going around to terminate the indictment and that it was clearly not a case of manslaughter. And people were really mad, okay? They were really going to bat with Rodney and believe that he shouldn't even be going to trial in the first place. People were really mad that a man wasn't allowed to protect his family and home without repercussions. To that, I say there's nothing wrong with protecting your home from imminent danger. Rodney was safe in his house. No one was actively trying to break in. No one was yelling threats and creating a scene on his lawn, as a matter of fact. He said in his own words that he himself looked out the window and he didn't see a thing. He's the one that went outside looking and arguably he was the imminent danger. So to folks that signed the petition, to them I'll just ask this simple question, okay? What would you do if it was your child in place of Yoshi gunned down? for simply ringing the wrong doorbell. Do you still sign that petition for the killer to go free? If you subscribe to that mindset, you realize you subscribe to blaming your own dead child for being dead. You might as well shake the killer's hand and apologize to him. Sorry, my son made you shoot him. I highly doubt you would sign that petition. Hey, if Rodney Pierce did nothing wrong, then what's a day in court? Especially if a grieving family wants it. Well, the petition didn't work and Rodney Pierce was going to trial. So the jury selection for this case was now underway. Potential jurors had to fill out a questionnaire that asked, have you ever experienced unannounced visitors at your home? How would you rate the safety of your neighborhood? How satisfied are you with the current police protection? Have you or anyone in your household ever owned a gun? If yes, 
what type of weapon and for what purpose. Do you or anyone in your household support any organization concerned about gun control laws? And with that, members of the jury were chosen and the trial began. So during the trial, Rodney's defense attorney worked hard to use self-defense as the motive, bringing up the Castle Doctrine defense. Now, in short, that's Americans' right to apply lethal means to protect their home. Now, it's not a federal law, but every state has adopted this doctrine in some way, shape, or form. Rodney's defense lawyer told the jurors to not mistake grief for the dead boy as guilt for Rodney. Guilt and grief are not the same thing. You're going to hear a lot about grief, but what you have to do here is decide about guilt. So understand, okay, this is not a hit piece on the Pierres because what I can gather about them after this entire ordeal was their life was also turned upside down. So we should at least take a look at their point of view from that night. So Rodney Pierre's, he is a 30 year old man that works at a local supermarket as a butcher to provide for his wife. He also has two children, one of which being just an infant at the time. When Rodney Pierce took the stand, he testified that on that night, Bonnie is preparing dinner. Rodney is on the couch with the kids. There's a knock at the door. They don't expect anyone. So Bonnie decides to use the carport door, which is yards away from the front door, to, you know, sneak a peek at who it was. And when I heard the doorbell ring, I got up, put my house coat on, and I went to answer the door. I turned on the porch light and uh, looked out through the blinds and then I opened the door and I saw a person. He was all bandaged up like he'd been in a car wreck. I didn't know uh, what kind of help they needed. Then all of a sudden, a second person come, came from around the corner real fast. And I'd say within a, a second or two, something just told me this isn't right. Because it, if someone's running towards you, then it must mean they mean harm. And I slammed the door and I locked it. That's when Rodney heard Bonnie slammed the door, which greatly annoyed Rodney because he hates it when people slam doors. Then Bonnie comes back in in a panic. It made him panic, especially when the only word she says is, Rodney, get the gun. Rodney says that he never seen his wife behave this way, which added to the pressure of the moment. And I will have to say, you know, in Rodney's defense, if my wife said, get the gun in a panic, I too would not waste any time. I would go get the gun. But once I came back with that gun, I would not do anything that Rodney proceeds to do. He gets the gun from a suitcase that was in their bedroom. He came back, peeked through the curtains and admitted he didn't see anyone. He then proceeds to open the door and go outside. Once outside, this is how he describes the night, okay? It was a person coming from behind a car, moving real fast. At that point, I pointed the gun and told him to freeze, but the person kept walking towards me, moving erratically. At the time, I hollered for him to stop. He didn't. He kept moving forward and was laughing. Rodney said that he was afraid that he was dealing with a crazy person. The trespasser also had something in his hand that he could not make out in the dark. That would turn out to be Yoshi's camera. He described Yoshi's movement further by adding that he moved in strange and scary ways. And you know, this may harken back to when Richard Haymaker said that Yoshi did not merely walk around the house, he almost danced. Rodney yelled, freeze but Yoshi did not stop. The defense further argued that Rodney Pierce, in large part, reacted reasonably to his wife's panic. And Bonnie Pierre, she would take the stand and testify for nearly an hour about the incident during which she cried several times. And this is a quote from the trial transcript. She says, he, meaning Yoshi, was coming real fast towards me. I had never had somebody come at me like that before. I was terrified. There was no thinking involved. I wish I could have thought if I could have just thought. 
So Bonnie Pears, from that testimony, appears to be very regretful of how she behaved that night. She wished she never told Rodney to get the gun. And that's understandable, considering an innocent boy lost his life. But then a few eyebrows would raise at her description of Yoshi. She would say, I guess he appeared oriental. He could have been Mexican or whatever. He was taller than me and his skin was darker colored. Now think of what happened. The moment um, Bonnie saw Webb, she thought nothing was unusual. She then saw Yoshi and within a half a second, the door was slammed and get your gun. You know, I kind of 100% agree. So why did Rodney go outside? The boys were already walking away. Nothing at this point was happening. The only reason I could think of is he was emboldened having that giant hand cannon in his grip. And to be honest, guys, it feels like he was the one looking for altercation. I mean, Yoshi is always smiling. And in a situation where he's saying, we're here for the party, he's definitely smiling. Rodney said himself, he was laughing. So why did Rodney shoot? And to be honest, I do feel race definitely had something to do with why Bonnie freaked the fuck out, so why would it be far-fetched to think that, hey, her husband might also feel the same way? When asked why he pulled the trigger, Rodney said, I had no choice. I want Yoshi's parents to understand that I'm sorry for everything. It was terror. A few character witnesses would take the stand, including neighbors, to paint Rodney as a model citizen, a good husband, a good father, a good neighbor, you know, standard praise, hoping it's enough for the jury to realize that he would never do something like this unless provoked. Now, on the prosecution side, the district attorney, of course, had a different picture to paint for the jury. You know, it was fine that Rodney was a good everything, but his lapse in good judgment that night led to the death of Yoshi Hattori. Rodney is six foot two, armed with a giant gun that night. Does the jury actually believe that Rodney came outside, leaving the safety of his home because he was scared? No. He came outside because he wasn't scared. It's hard to see how all 130 pounds of Yoshi would intimidate a man like Rodney. The DA would mention that the only thing the kids did that night was ring the wrong doorbell. Why were these people so scared of two 16-year-old boys that were actually leaving at the time. And the bottom line is, Bonnie should have never overreacted to seeing an ethnic person like she did. She should have never frightened Rodney by screaming at him to get the gun. And Rodney should have never left the house if he was so scared. All they had to do was call 911 and an innocent boy. Yoshi Hattori would still be alive today. Now, I think I forgot to tell you when this trial took place, I believe. The trial took place in May of 1993. It lasted a week, and according to BBC, it was a media circus. Now, interestingly, the jury only took three hours to deliberate, coming back with a verdict of not guilty. He was acquitted of all the charges, and it was reported that the courtroom stood up, applauded, and cheered the verdict. Now, Rodney was described as being visibly shaking. As tears streamed down his face, he said, I'm sorry, to the courtroom. He told reporters that he never wanted to own a gun ever again. Now, the Pierre's family, they would eventually move out of their house and reportedly even out of town. The jury believed that Rodney's decision made sense. That was their property. They own that. They have the right to protect it. They have the right to go outside the door anytime they want to. Yoshi's father, Masaichi, he was there for every single day of the trial, all seven days. He had to sit there and endure looking at his son's killer as he made excuses to why his son died. Listening to reasons why it was his son's own fault. And we could only imagine how difficult something like that could be. And you know what? Thank goodness he had the comfort 
of the haymakers who were there for him every single step of the way. And the only time that they left the courtroom was to excuse themselves just before the verdict was read. Maybe the tension was just too much for them because the outcome was really important, you know, for the memory of Yoshi. And they got the news as they were walking outside getting fresh air. And needless to say, they were in complete shock. Masaichi felt that his son had died in vain. And I wanted to believe that the people applauding and cheering the verdict, I really wanted to believe that that was another embellishment of this story over the years, you know, because I found this first on Wikipedia, and I would have been happy to have left that part of the story out completely. Except I found another article by a David Shimke, published by carlton.edu, and this verified to me that it did happen as reported from the media within. And the exact words were, erupted in cheers. And why would I trust? carlton.edu. Well, that is Carlton College, the college that Richard Haymaker graduated in 1961, the same college that Webb would follow in his father's footsteps and attend and be the class of 1998. That's why I would trust Carlton EDU. And in terms of this article, Shimke interviewed Richard and Webb about these events. So now I have to believe that my fellow Americans that day cheered the death of an innocent Japanese boy. Now, I know they're not cheering for that specifically. They're cheering for the fact that their rights weren't in jeopardy because they felt that if Rodney went to jail for protecting his property, then all their rights are out the window. But that wasn't the case for this particular case, as I hope is clear at this point. Rodney killed a child because he rang his doorbell. That was it. And you know, when I think back, I am so glad that Masaichi was not in the courtroom that day, that Yoshi's dad was outside walking and getting some air because if he was there and watched as people applauded his son's death, if other countries read this article like Japan did, they'll just assume we're all barbarians. And... Honestly, nobody wins in a case like this. So the reaction should have been silence. Everybody get up, leave the courtroom. So when the news got to Webb, it's needless to say that he was also shocked. But he was also very angry, especially when they made Yoshi, his beautiful friend, out to be this ugly, strange moving monster. They made his happy-go-lucky personality out to be erratic and menacing. So the killing of Yoshi Hattori, it would highlight internationally America's gun culture. Now, I must clarify that this is coming from me, okay? I am a half-breed. I'm half Californian and half Texan. So I've lived on both sides of the argument when it comes to guns. I do own a gun, but that doesn't mean I'm deaf to the concerns of others when it comes to gun control. Because who doesn't want to live in a world with no guns and peace. And the reason why I own a gun, okay, is because I feel I need to feel safe in the world that I believe I live in. It was morning in Japan when the news of the verdict made it to its anxious citizens. They had footage and translation as the verdict was read and needless to say, they were baffled at the outcome and the stereotype that America was this gun obsessed nation It was all but confirmed by this verdict. Now, Mieko, Yoshi's mother, in pure, raw pain, she confessed to Steve Crump, which was the reverend of Yoshi's funeral. She wrote to him, We almost wished we could shoot the chest of the person that killed Yoshi and say it was done by mistake. But that would be a shameful thing to do. And it was on this somber plane ride back home to Japan that Mieko had a dream about Yoshi. And in it, her son told her to compose this petition to urge Americans to remove guns from their household. And before the plane even landed in Japan, Mieko had already written out this whole mission statement. The Hattori's would go on to utilize the media 
to launch this campaign calling for an end to easy access to firearms in the U.S. The petition went viral, okay, and they gathered nearly 1.8 million Japanese signatures. Now, the haymakers, they became somewhat of an extension of the Hattori's efforts, but in the U.S. The haymakers have continued their gun control efforts. In September 1994, they helped organize a silent march in Washington, D.C. Over 40,000 pairs of shoes were placed around the Capitol to demonstrate the thousands of Americans killed by guns every year. Many of the shoes belong to actual victims. Changes may come little by little. But we are sure that one day a safe America will come true. Only when that happens, Yoshi's life will not have been wasted. I will say this though, like as I was doing research for this story, there was like at least on Yoshi's side, his parents, the haymakers, and now yourself and even your mother. Uh -huh. I would consider you people very impressed. You people, I don't know if that's a bad thing to say. <laughs> <laughs> but all the characters on Yoshi's side is kind of very impressive. And you yourself, the the website that I found you on, that is your website, right? I'm gonna mm -hmm. put it on the screen in the description and whatnot. And it is oh, thank you. Yeah, is this concerning health, right? Yeah. And, yeah, that's right. And your mom, you just mentioned she started to be an activist for this situation. I go, wow, mm -hmm. people don't just get up and go like that. No, but, that's true. And yeah. lot, right. And a lot of people didn't, right? A lot of mm -hmm. people just I mean, I looking back, I think, how could the school have not talked to us about this? How could the school have just gone on like everything was normal? When a, a child, essentially a, a, a teen, had just been gunned down, you know, a, a yeah. visiting, a visitor to our country. So, um, but you're right. I think some people did just, you know, just accepted it and kind of moved on. I think all, all the all of Yoshi's classmates like us were probably just a little shocked and didn't even understand where to put it. Um, but then there were people that were really galvanized to action because it was so tragic it was just yeah. so tragic and horrible and you know sometimes you just do anything you can and because of this both families they became lifelong advocates for gun control now richard he was so consumed with this cause he began circulating a similar petition in the united states calling on the president himself to quote reassess the easy availability of guns in this country and in doing so help the senseless death of Americans and foreign visitors which threatens the very fabric of our democratic society. Now he alone was able to gather 150,000 signatures and this is the pre-internet way guys. Phone calls, licking stamps and ironically knocking on doors. Now through the efforts of the Hattori's and the Haymakers, this would gain national attention. And by July of 1993, President Bill Clinton personally called the Hattori's to give them his condolences. And just a few months down the line, the Hattori's and the Haymakers would be invited to Washington, D.C. and meet with the president in the White House. No, the families, they sat with President Clinton, with whom they felt was very sympathetic to their cause, and had what they perceived as a productive chat in the Oval Office. Mieko would also humorously describe Clinton as a rugged man with red cheeks. They would discuss America's easy access to firearms. Mieko said to Clinton, the life of my son will never be back but I don't want his death to be in vain. I don't want to see more agony. I like America very much. This is why we are working for this endeavor. So everyone felt that this meeting went over very well, and it did. Because just a few weeks after, President Bill Clinton signed into law the Brady Handgun Violence Prevention Act, which now required background checks on handgun buyers and a five-day waiting period on all purchases. And it was a remarkable victory. The U.S. ambassador to Japan made a trip to Japan to meet the Hattori's at their home and personally show them a copy of the bill just to let them know that their son's life was given to make a difference in an entire nation. But outrage from Japan towards the U.S. happened again 
1994. But in March 1994, the people of Japan were again outraged by an incident of American gun violence. In Los Angeles, two Japanese college students were killed in a carjacking, a crime never before encountered in Japan. But while the criminal intent behind these deaths was very different from Rodney Pierce's motives in defending his home, many in Japan saw it as another symptom of a gun culture spinning out of control. The U.S. ambassador to Japan made a public apology. The American people deplore this senseless act of criminal violence, and we share in the sorrow of the Japanese people. Now, if you were paying attention to the news back in the 90s, okay, the coverage of this case, meaning Yoshi's case, these stories in the United States was very minimal. As much as the haymakers would make the rounds, you know, on radio networks and morning TV shows, it was dwarfed in comparison to how serious Japan was covering these cases. And it will go to show that for grieving parents, their work is never really done if their son's killer had faced absolutely no punishment. They would go on to file a wrongful death lawsuit against Rodney Pierre's and his home insurance company in civil court. So we could only imagine that Rodney Pierre's, he went on with his life, right? He probably thought the whole situation was behind him and now he finds himself in another trial to relive this whole nightmare. And during this trial, the Hattori's family attorney chose to emphasize that racism definitely played a hand in why Yoshi isn't alive today. Yoshi's skin was the wrong color that night. And didn't Bonnie testify during the criminal trial that she had guessed that he appeared Oriental, he could have been Mexican or whatever? I have often wished that we'd had a French boy or a Norwegian boy because I'm not so sure that that boy would have been shot. In what way? Do you think it contributed to her fear? Yeah. Looking she outside said, and seeing an unfamiliar face? Yeah, she said, I knew he was darker than me. And in that clip, I feel Holly makes it pretty clear what she's getting at. For Bonnie to even bring up skin tone is a clear indication that it affected her. If she had seen a white boy, do we think she'll be saying, yeah, that boy had the same skin as me? <laughs> Probably not. I didn't believe he was black. Even if he was, that wouldn't have had anything to do with it. It was his fast movement toward that door that scared me so bad, not the color of the skin. And in my opinion, I just believe that you know, she's not around a lot of minorities, and she has this preconceived prejudice that minorities are dangerous, no matter what distance. Breaking news. Oh, well, broken iPad. I'm a minority, and I have experienced racism firsthand. Nothing major, just a nuisance, I could say. And once I calm down, I can chalk it up to basic ignorance. 1992 Louisiana, I bet they didn't see many, if any, Asians. And I'll give them this. People fear what they don't understand, and that's okay. But considering what happened, the question for Rodney that night was, who is outside, what are they doing, versus the magnitude of his response. I personally feel that Rodney should have gotten some jail time. And also, I'll just add in, I read that police questioned him briefly after the incident and they themselves deemed it was self-defense. Now, what if I say a black man had killed a young white kid in his front yard? Would that questioning have been that brief? And Webb, that night, did more than Yoshi ever did. He was at the doorstep. He rang the doorbell. But I guess, fortunately, he was the right color. The boys weren't dressed in anything crazy. He simply looked like an Asian kid wearing a blazer and a puffy shirt. There was nothing menacing about either boy. So why did one have to die? And why didn't Rodney stay outside after he shot Yoshi to see what the other culprit was up to? Doesn't it feel like mission complete? Time to head in. In the end, the judge ruled that self-defense was not a good enough reason under those circumstances to end an entire life over. Rodney clearly was in no imminent danger. 653,000 
$77.85 was awarded to the Hattori family in which the Pierre's homeowner insurance paid $100,000 up and the remainder would be garnered from Rodney's wages in perpetuity until the balance is paid off. For the Hattori's, it was not about the money, of course. It was about justice for Yoshi. It was about Yoshi not dying for nothing. The money they did receive was used to start a charitable fund called the Yoshihiro Hattori Memorial Fund, a scholarship to promote intercultural understanding and peace. It allowed American high school students to travel to Japan in hopes that they would study there, experience a new culture, and leave a positive mark on the world in the spirit of Yoshi. And since 1994, it has funded about 31 students from the U.S. to study in Japan. Yoshi loved the United States even before he arrived and during his very brief time there. The fund was also a way to show Japanese citizens that not all Americans are what is depicted in, in their news stories. The Haymakers. They were with the Hattori's every step of the way. Yoshihiro had impacted their lives in more ways than one. And though it was unfortunate that the two families bonded over tragedy, it forged an unbreakable bond to this day. In 2022, the Hattori's, now in their mid-70s, finally retired after three decades of gun control activism. Their tireless efforts and their story has made a huge impact on countless lives. Now I want to take a little time to talk about Web Haymaker. And, uh, you know, mainly how this story is told. Naturally, it revolves around the victim, the one that lost their life. And uh, Web's story, maybe by his own design, would melt into the background because, you know, that's how he approached life. He put others before himself. In the wake of Yoshi's death, he gave some interviews, he did, ta he did take the stand and give his testimony, and that would be pretty much all we would see of Webb in terms of being in the public eye. So, you know, just something just occurred to me right now. Um, when you emailed me back as we were playing email tag for a while before we got this, mm -hmm. you did say that you tried to contact Webb, but he didn't message you back. Right. Right. Um, mm -hmm. Do you know that Webb has passed away? No, no. I. It looks like he. I don't know. Actually, that's a good question. He has. He has. He's what? Webb in 2022 committed suicide. <gasps> I'm sorry. He had. Uh, you had to hear that. But I think he was dealing with a lot of mental health issues, and his family also said from reports I'll put into quotes that he dealt with a lot of survivor's guilt. Of um, course. Yeah. Oh, that is crushing. Um just like I'm I'm so sad. Mm -hmm. in, I it, am so sad. And in 2022, that was the 30 year anniversary. Yes. 2022 is when I wrote the blog because it was 30 years. And I like I wrote in my blog, it's like the whole thing just like came to me like it had just happened. It was like it came up again for me. Um, I did not know. But what I saw on Facebook was that he has a young daughter. He does. And he had another one on the way as well. I read his obituary, you know, it's going through uh, trying to get to understand oh Webb more. And that's why this story became even bigger. more bigger, more human. As I researched it from all the other stuff that I've watched, and I didn't want to get anything wrong in this case. And yeah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry I had to be the one to tell you. And So what's so sad about it is that the casualties just go and go and go. Because yeah. years Pierce later, did, Pierce didn't just kill Yoshi. You know, he hurt oh. a lot of people. He hurt a lot of people. I mean, I know that he... I know that he probably didn't mean to hurt so many people you know, to hurt an innocent person, but he really did. He caused a lot of pain and suffering with that decision he, he made. Oh, God, I didn't know. And you know what? I didn't know that Webb had passed away. So I, oh, God, it's so sad. That is so sad. And I can't imagine his parents. 
Yes, I reached out. God. I reached out to Holly Haymaker and Richard Haymaker. Um, no response, and I completely understand that. Um, oh, gosh. I I really wish I could have known more about Webb. There was something deep about Webb, and he was an intellectual. And I watched his um, eulogy online. There is actually a eulogy online for Webb at a church. Um, wow. A lot of people cared about him. We'll put it that way. Yeah, and he's leaving a beautiful family behind. Um, but he couldn't. Well, from what I gather, it did say in the obituary that he took his own life. Um, it didn't say why. So. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, you know, he was 16 years old. He went. You know, he. I mean, the guilt. I mean, yeah, the guilt just goes around and around. I mean, I. Um, I just, it, it really pains me to think that he has young children that are now, you know, hurt, scarred for life, missing their father. Oh gosh, that's awful. I did wonder how Webb, you know, survived the, the, I mean, that's a lot. That is a lot for a teenage, just like it was horrible what Yoshi went through and lost his life. It was really horrible that. Webb was also a victim, of course, yes. and he could have just as easily died, um, been murdered. So, uh, yeah, that's oh, – gosh. So through all the research, we'll try our best, you know, to get to know Webb. And, well, the thing that we do know about Webb is he was just 16 years old when all this happened, and it took the ambulance at least – 30 minutes to arrive and we just have to think about that because 30 minutes after having just watched your friend being shot now hearing a gunshot up close is jarring enough let alone a 44 caliber gunshot so seeing someone you care about get shot that is devastating and from the moment he rang that doorbell it was a matter of minutes that all this unfolded and after Yoshi gets shot, it was 30 minutes of applying pressure to a wound that would not stop bleeding. 30 minutes of watching his friend who he's only known to be full of life and then finally watching your friend being placed onto a stretcher, Webb would describe seeing Yoshi's jacket and shirt sopping Red. Now, I would try to find as much detail in this situation as I could find, and I did find that it would take another 30 minutes after Yoshi was taken away in the ambulance that, that Webb had to wait before he was finally taken down to the police station, place him in that large cold room with harsh lights as Holly Haymaker described finding her son. And I really did want to find out more about who Webb was, his personality, you know, who this warm character, warm, caring character was. And, and I kept digging, I kept digging. I found an old video of Holly giving a lecture on gun control, recapping this story. Now, I left a message on that video asking if there was any way to get in contact with, you know, Mrs. Haymaker. But it seems like everything on this channel is 11 years old. It was done so long ago, so probably not. I haven't heard from them yet, and it's been two weeks. So what we could gather about Webb was that he was polite, soft-spoken, at least as a boy he was, and that he was more academically gifted than he was socially, and that's because he took after his father, Richard, who is a self-admitted introvert with a gifted mind. And if you remember the situation where the haymakers had just picked up Webb from the police station and he was described as dispassionate about this traumatic event, well, years down the line, Webb would actually explain that he was actually very upset, not only at the situation, but that people thought that he wasn't upset enough. Quote, I was a 16-year-old boy. I really wasn't into my emotions. I just didn't think about it. I didn't know how to process my feelings. So in my research, I was able to pick up Webb's life in the fall of 1994, which is a couple of years down the line. So Webb would take a senior trip 
to Japan, which included a town hall meeting about gun control, and he would return home to the U.S. to attend college. And in 1995, he would testify in that civil action against Rodney Pierre's. Now, this time around, the verdict was what the families were fighting for. It made Webb incredibly happy to when the verdict was reached. But Webb also recalls that just an hour later, he was flooded with grief again. And he would say that that's when he really finally began to process what had happened. It took Webb nearly two years to come to grips with the death of his friend. And that's a long time to be holding on to a pain without answers or relief. Now, it's worth noting that the Pierres did file an appeal, but that was to no avail. And even though Rodney stated that he never wanted to own a gun again, to the press, the show Justice Files that documented this case in 1993 revealed that the Pierres did indeed still kept several guns in their house. So in terms of Yoshi and Webb, I mean, it, it was a beautiful friendship. I mean, the saying opposites attract is very true in this case. And if you combine Webb and Yoshi into one being, that would be one well-rounded being, it feels to me. And as much as Webb may have admired Yoshi for the person that he was, there's no doubt, at least in my mind, that there was obviously a lot for Yoshi to admire and respect about Webb. The events of that night would change the course of anyone's life in terms of how they viewed and even interacted with the world. Now, Webb could have been down and out. He could have rebelled and succumbed to the anger and the hate, but Webb chose compassion instead. Like I mentioned earlier, Webb went to the same college as his old man did, and as written in his obituary, that he cherished his years at Carleton College. Now, Webb would go on to earn two master degrees in contemporary literature and clinical social work. And from there, he tried to live as normal as he could, start his own family, all the while helping others as the forefront of his life's mission. And to this field, of course, he brought an amazing perspective. As a survivor of trauma himself, he would help people deal with the aftermath of trauma. He utilized that brilliant mind of his, which was also sensitive to the plight of others, you know, to help them deal with the struggles of mental health, depression, anxiety. All the while, he himself was battling the exact same thing. So effectively, you didn't just get sympathy from Webb, you got empathy. You had someone who felt and said, exactly what you needed because he needed it as well. And of course, I never knew Webb. I wasn't able to speak to someone who did. He seemed like the kind that would give you his warmest smile, even though there was a war raging within himself. But for him, I think it was if he could make you feel better, even for the time being, then he himself was content, at least for the time being.